No barking, Ola. <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome back to Mental Health Mondays. I thought what better way to kick off Mental Health Mondays again than by bringing in a guest to my channel. This is Lars and I'll let him introduce himself to you because he's going to be answering some questions in this video. Thank you very much for having me Maddie and hi to you out there. My name is Lars Hansen. I'm a psychiatrist. Now, I'm originally from Denmark, if you were wondering about my accent, but I've trained in this country and I'm very, very keen to answer some of your questions. I'm deeply impressed by the quality of the questions you've sent in, so I'm looking forward to this. And he's not just any psychiatrist, he is my psychiatrist, obviously. That's, that why, I, that's why I've got <laughs> him on here. Um, I don't, how long has it been that I've been seeing you now? Six years. Six years. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, and long, long six time. eventful years. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. So I got you guys to send me in questions to give to Lars. Um, basically questions that people have been too scared to ask a psychiatrist or just want to know about, you know, psychiatrists in general. Mm. We have a long list. Like, let me tell you, I don't think I've had so many questions for a mental health video before. So we're just going to get right into them because I said to Lars, make your answers concise. We're going to dive right into the first question, um, which says, not really a question, but is your psychiatrist NHS or private? Um, and I guess maybe just give us a bit of background on psychiatrists in general. Thank you, Maddie. And a good question because many people don't actually know what the difference is between a psychologist, a therapist and a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. So a psychiatrist is a person that has a medical background. So I, I'm a, a medical doctor and then I've trained in psychiatry just like some doctors train in surgery or becoming eye doctors. I've trained in psychiatry. So I can prescribe medication and I also have a relatively good understanding of the anatomy of the brain and those kind of things. But I've also trained and, and some psychiatrists have not every, every psychiatrist in, in therapy and Maddie knows this, but my kind of therapy is cognitive therapy. While a therapist is someone that's trained in some kind of version of therapy, and a psychologist has a degree in psychology, uh, but is not a medically trained person. But, but basically what's very important here is that whether you feel that you can relate to that person that you are seeing, it's hugely important and we know for the outcome that's the most important factor. Yeah, Lola's just about to kick off! Lola! <laughs> Lola is a naughty girl. I was trained in the NHS and I still work four days a week in the NHS. But I'm also having a, a small private practice here in the New Forest uh, where Maddie has seen me for, for many years. Yeah. The next question, Lola just wanted to come in and join in and for this one. Because she wants to know, <laughs> does a teenager need to have an adult with them to see a psychiatrist? No, in principle not. So if the teenager feels that it's relevant to see the therapist or the psychiatrist on his or her own, she can certainly come alone. It's a bit of a grey area because it's also up to the psychiatrist whether they feel that the level of maturity is right. But from mm. 12 years onwards, there's certainly a possibility to see the psychiatrist alone. Yeah. yeah, because I feel like some people may be having issues with their parents who would be the people that will come Absolutely. along and they obviously don't want to say that in front of their parents to you. So, so. and you're, what you're saying there is that so many of our problems are rooted in our relationships to other people, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, okay, next question. Is it rude to tell a friend you think they would benefit from a psychiatrist? Definitely not, because I think that we... In fact, many of us, whether we have a mental illness or not, we could we could do with therapy and yeah. uh, and and seeing a psychiatrist or a therapist. And, and I think it's actually our job as friends to say to other people, well, actually, I think there is a problem there. And of course, the earlier we get hold of these problems, the less difficult it is to treat, rather than letting it fester for for years and end, which many people do. Yeah, and I want to say I think you say it nicely. I think you're just being a good friend. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, okay, next question. How do I trust a psychiatrist? Oh, trust is <laughs> essential in our lives. And, and in fact, uh, when Maddie came here to me six years ago, I, I said to her that I would like to do an initial assessment 
And then it was important for Maddie to go home and talk to mum and dad and to friends about what it felt like to sit here, get some kind of gut feeling about what yeah. it felt like. And that's probably the best way we can do this. And one more comment, trust is not an either or thing. We're usually on a continuum between trusting completely and not trusting at all. And if we can maybe have 70-80% of trust in a therapist, that's a really good start. And then hopefully we will trust more over time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The more I got to know you, the more I opened up to you. So trust is gained. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Rather than yeah. given. Yes, I agree with that. And also to the right people, like you'll know if you see a psychiatrist and you just think, oh, I, feel, I don't really feel like I could tell them my problems. Do you think people get let down by the mental health services slash lack of? I, I definitely think that they do. <laughs> this is a big question. It is a big question, <laughs> but so many people are let down by our system. Uh, and the NHS, we are, in, in some ways in disarray at the moment. We can't recruit psychiatrists or psychiatric nurses mm. and we need to make it more attractive somehow for people to come in. And it's a fascinating area, so if any of you are thinking about <laughs> doing anything in psychiatry, please come in and help us. Um, so, But people are being let down. But of course, something I would much rather do than treat people is try to prevent these conditions. Yeah. Yes, and I think we can do much more not just the NHS, but us as a society, to try to see if we can prevent these conditions from occurring in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of medical students wanting to get into psychiatry, <laughs> there's a question that says, um, do you find any medical students annoying? Hello from one. <laughs> <laughs> no, medical students, they are a gift and, and we need more of them. Yeah. And in fact, the ones that we have at Southampton University they are almost without fail wonderful people, very interested, but sadly in the end they don't end up taking up psychiatry, they become mm. some kind of other doctor. Oh. Yeah, so that's sad. The next question in this kind of section, because I've sectioned these questions up, is do you find it annoying when people want your help but then don't open up slash are scared to? It's a good question. No, I don't f I find that annoying at all because I think it's out of fear that people don't open up. A and my job is to try to understand what's behind all of this, why they're not opening up, yeah. but not annoying at all. A and I, I sympathize with it. It's not so easy to sit and tell another person. No. Sometimes it's also difficult for ourselves to express what it actually is that's hurting inside. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. and that's your job to get it out of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next section is diagnoses. Mm -hmm. I said that right? Diagnoses? Yes, you yeah. <laughs> okay, if someone comes in and says they think they have a certain diagnosis, do you listen to them? That I would not be doing my job if I didn't because people have often thought a lot about what's wrong with them before yeah. they turn up. Yeah. But I also have to say that diagnosis in general in psychiatry, they are very vague, uh, very vague. Uh, and they're only based on observation. There is no blood test or head scan that can tell us what's wrong with people. <laughs> Unfortunately. Uh, and that's also one of the reasons why if you go to several psychiatrists, they will come up sometimes with different diagnoses. Don't put too much emphasis on the diagnosis. What we want you to, to experience is that you improve in your level of functioning and happiness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That leads on to the next question really nicely because it says, do you feel people want to self-diagnose for relief in today's society? So like you said, a lot of people have done research beforehand, maybe gone on Google, etc., Googled their symptoms, and they just want that diagnosis. Mm. Yes, I see that a lot really. Mm. Uh, there are certain diagnoses that are more popular than others. At the moment, bipolar diagno the bipolar diagnosis is very popular. And I think it does give some sense of relief to know that other people may have suffered from something mm -hmm. similar. Mm -hmm. But the, the downside of this is that sometimes if we say we have an illness, it can remove some responsibility from us. But in fact, of course, what we really need is to make an effort ourselves to get better. Uh, so it's a double-edged sword, those Yeah, diagnoses. I know, that's a really interesting point. Do you think there's such a thing of being the illest? or is every mental illness just as severe? 
I think people suffer if they have mental health problems. I think they do. Uh, and that's of course our job to try to see if we can make them better. But there are certain mental illnesses that I think are reasonable to categorize as more severe, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, the more severe end of the spectrum for me, that's something like psychosis, schizophrenia, yeah. bipolar disorder. Um, and they are probably those kind of illnesses down that end of the spectrum. They are more related to our genetic heritage, so, so our, our nature rather than nurture. I was going to say, do you class it on whether, you know, how much they are as a danger to society slash themselves? Oh, that's interesting. I, I think that's also one of the ways that we could measure how severe an illness is. Mm. But it's also how much functioning is reduced. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. I, I think that's very important. And, mm -hmm. and how much quality of life is reduced is hugely important too. Someone has asked, what's the hardest illness to treat and why? Is there one? <laughs> Um, there are some of the illnesses that are difficult, but it's very important to remember that most people, also at the severe end of the spectrum, they can get hugely much better with some relevant and evidence-based treatments. Mm -hmm. um, but there are some of the addiction problems that are very difficult to treat. Yeah. Though, again, not impossible. I have certainly seen people that have been addicted to, for example, alcohol for 40 years, that suddenly have managed to stop um, and, and get better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so nothing is impossible. Yeah. Um, and on the same kind of theme, someone has asked, "Can you not be qualified to go to therapy because your problems aren't big enough?" No, I, I wouldn't say that. That that's not for for us to say. It's for the sufferer or for the patient to tell us whether they think that they are suffering mm -hmm. so much. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I think a lot of people feel ashamed. They think, "Oh no, my problems are not big enough." Yeah, that's uh, like me. <laughs> yes, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I wanted to I'm say like, that. I haven't gone through a, like a major childhood trauma, so why have I got this diagnosis? You know. Yeah, but it's as if we don't like uh, just as the the person is asking here whether we are qualified. If we suffer, of course we're qualified. Yeah, this is a good one. How do you relate and advise the patient if you've maybe not felt the same feelings? Mm. Obviously, you can't have had every single mental illness, so that's, that's a how lot do to you ask. relate to people? It's a, such a good question because mm. you could also ask uh, a doctor that's treating a, a liver cancer. Yeah, saying, well, that's actually, that's very uh, true. <laughs> you haven't yeah. had liver cancer. Yeah. Or you could say, why are men gynecologists? Because yeah, there, clearly there's not so many male gynecologists. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a whole can of worms to open yeah. that one. But you could think they, they have never had period pain. They have never yeah, had a pregnancy. But I think we can try to empathize to a large degree. And mm -hmm. I, in mental health, what we've all tried is we've all felt anxious. We've all felt inadequate. So that's not so difficult to empathize with. Yeah, no, you do give me some anecdotes as well from your own personal life in therapy, which I do th find helpful. That, that's yeah. interesting to hear because yeah. the modern therapy, we are allowed to do that. In the old kind of therapy where people are li uh, lying on a couch, yeah. the therapist was not allowed to say anything. Mm. But I, I think it is important, of course, the focus is on the patient. But a little bit of input from the therapist. Yeah, definitely. To humanise us. That's exactly, and that's what makes them trust you and want to open up to you. I, I, so. I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you judge people's life decisions? Um, <laughs> the honest answer is probably I do somehow, because I'm also just human. But I try to understand why they took those decisions. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's the most important thing, because Sometimes it's also unclear to the patient why they've taken certain decisions in their lifetime. But of course, looking at that and shedding light on why they took those decisions, that can be life-changing. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel judged. That's good. No, Maddie, I feel like Maddie. I can pretty much tell Lars anything and it's fine. Like He might be a bit like, Manny, why did you do that? But he's like, okay, let's look at why you did it. <laughs> I think that is how it works. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, this little section is on suicide. So, mm. what do you do if someone comes in and says that they're going to commit suicide? Mm. 
Thanks for that uh, question. My research for the last 25 years has been on suicide, as you know, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, and my PhD is on that subject too. I take it very seriously, and we have to. Suicide yeah. remains relatively stable. Many other uh, causes of death in modern society, they're getting a lot better. Like, for example, there are fewer heart attacks, there are fewer can uh, people that die from cancer and heart attacks, but suicide unfortunately it remains relatively stable so I do take it very seriously and I try to understand what's behind it mm -hmm. and the main message here in suicide is that the antidote to suicidal behavior that's a sense of meaning in life that there is something that yeah. keeps us here on this earth mm -hmm. and we create meaning actually by doing good things for other people yeah. by seeking pleasure by seeking relationships and trying to understand the world better and better. And that's the best antidote really to wanting to kill yourself. Yeah, definitely buying a puppy oh, oh, <laughs> is, a, is a good, good she, antidote. <laughs> that Lola is the best therapist in the yeah, world. Just look is, at her now. Yes, I know. <laughs> um, okay, are you sad when you hear what's going on in a patient's mind? I'm deeply touched by some of the stories that I come across, mm. deeply touched. And I think it's also actually often what the patient is looking for, seeing that it touches someone else. Yeah. We'll talk more bo about borderline personality disorder later on. Yeah, but, yeah. But I think when people do harm themselves, when they do strange, outrageous things, it's often in the hope of being taken in by someone else. Mm -hmm. So I, I am genuinely touched uh, and I'm not afraid of showing it either. Yeah, no, it must be. I always think this must be a really hard thing is to want to help but also remain detached from the situation because obviously you hear so many sad stories and that can be a lot because you are obviously a human mm. as well to um, you know remain professional and think of that as your work and not think about these people's stories you know, when you're going to sleep at night. It, it is tough, but it would yeah. be even tougher if I didn't respond in an yeah. emotional way. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. The next question is, how can I bring up with my parents that I'm having suicidal thoughts? The straight answer to that question is that you have to do that. Yeah. It's very important that you talk to other people because a therapist is just a professional speaking partner or conversational partner. That's what it is. And opening up to other people we often find out things about ourselves that we didn't know was inside ourselves. Mm. There's a beautiful quote that we only find ourselves in conversation with others. And there's a lot of truth in that. And of course, if you have suicidal thoughts, that's very disturbing. You do need to talk to them uh, and find the right time and the right place where you feel comfortable to talk about this and understand what the reasons are behind it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just want to add one thing. Yeah. Suicidal thoughts, though they're scary, they're pretty common. And we don't know exactly how many percent of the population that has, has had suicidal thoughts. But I would have thought that it's probably the majority at some stage, the majority of all of us that have had thoughts about ending it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, this is more about specific illnesses that you guys have sent in. Um, so, okay, we're just going to touch on this because like Lars said, I had loads of questions about BPD and you may or may not know that that's what I've been diagnosed with, so I wanted to make like a, a separate video specifically on that, but I'm going to start with one um, that says, do you instantly think, oh God, if a patient has BPD because it's so stigmatised and I feel like professionals hate people with it because of the sig stigma? It is a fantastically good question again, a and I'm afraid I have seen professionals that, if not been, that have not been hateful, at least has somehow tried to take a step away from this mm -hmm. condition. But if it sometimes does feel tiring for us professionals to deal with, you just for a moment have to think about what that person has gone through to develop these symptoms. Yeah. <laughs> And they're not doing it to, to they don't, they're not having these symptoms to entertain us professionals yeah. or, or to yeah. piss us off. They're having them because they're somehow bothered. Mm -hmm. and, and like with you, 
Maddie, look how much you've improved, and in fact, you clearly don't have that diagnosis exactly. any longer. And it's rough. well, that's a that's a whole other that, but kind I, of worms. Can you recover from it? But we'll talk about that later. I, mean, I, I, I would like to comment on yeah, that right yeah, yeah. now. Of course you can. Mm -hmm. like so many of our diagnoses are given and people think, oh, it's a lifelong sentence. Yeah, no, yeah, it yeah. bloody isn't. Mm -hmm. Next question is about anxiety. Are you born with anxiety or do you develop it? So anxiety is the most common symptom that we come across uh, in psychiatry at all. Uh, and it's a part of a normal human experience. Uh, and the boring answer is that we are born with a... a uh, some kind of tendency to anxiety but it can certainly be nurtured during our childhood so it can get worse or better but anxiety is the condition in psychiatry that responds the best to treatment at all that's yeah. good to know yeah i'm surprised that you didn't bring up the uh, line in the room analogy on that one it, that will come <laughs> next time do you want to bring it up Lars always gives this analogy when it comes to anxiety because it's talking about being born with it yeah. and you know he's like you know if a lion walks in the, this room right now how would you react <laughs> obviously your body would you know you'd your adrenaline would come and that's exactly how it feels when you get anxious but it's misplaced you know when, misplaced. When, you're at, when you have anxiety but we cannot live without anxiety but we can't allow it to take over our lives yeah, yeah? exactly um, okay, so this is a good one. Thoughts on being prescribed antidepressants from a GP? Mm. So antidepressants is an easy go-to for, for a busy GP. They will hand out antidepressants, probably inappropriately in some cases. Mm -hmm. But it's easy for me to criticise. They have so little time with the patient. Yeah. I think it's about less than 10 minutes per patient. Mm -hmm. And I do understand that, that that's what many GPs do, but especially for young people, antidepressants uh, and their e e efficacy has been questioned in, in some very important studies. Yeah. It does look as if the older you are, the more effective are antidepressants, and I don't think anybody mm. knows why that is. Uh -huh. And antidepressants are also more likely to give young people serious side effects. So I would it's it's a last resort the antidepressants and there are many things to start with before that yeah talking therapies mm -hmm. understanding why and where the anxiety or the depression comes from yeah but obviously that's a difficult one isn't it because you might not be able to get talking therapy for no. a matter of months and then it's like this is the only thing that the gp can Absolutely. really do instantly so of course people want that instant solution but obviously and, and realizing yeah. that rarely is an instant solution. Yeah. There are some people where the antidepressant works like a miracle cure, mm -hmm. but it's definitely the exception rather than the rule. How to get past a depressive episode? So the main message here is to try to understand what the underlying reasons for the depression is. Why are you depressed? What is it that's causing this? Is it something that I can do something about? And very importantly, try to take back responsibility. We call that locus of control. So take, pack, uh, for example, I've just seen a young man now that, that is drinking too much, doing lots of other things. If he can say, okay, I want to reduce my drinking, I want to get back to exercise, I want to get back to working, I think he would feel more in charge instead of saying, oh, it's because other people don't like me and those kind of things. So the more you can have your hands on the steering wheel, that's the best way out of a depressive episode along with understanding what's the underlying causes of it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think goals are really good because in the first um, session, you made me write down goals. Yes, that's right. And then looking back on them is um, really, really important, I think. Yeah, what did you think that gave you to look at the goals? A sense of achievement. Yeah. Yeah, because you forget how far you've come until you look back. Like nowadays, I, like when I have a bad day, I always think, oh, like I'm back to square one, but then I'm actually like, no because I can pull myself out of it so much quicker. You can? So much quicker, like in like minutes, whereas it would have taken me weeks in the past, you know? So. And, and goal setting is also good because it gives us something to aim towards. Yeah. Don't necessarily have to go in a straight line. No, because with, <laughs> with recovery, it's like this. And that is how it is. Yeah. yeah it's more like this. It does go <laughs> up here, doesn't it? Um, yeah, no, it does. It does go up. Yeah. But it's like, it does a few 
loop de loops. What do you think when someone not underway comes in with an eating disorder, specifically anorexia or bulimia? It's quite common actually that mm. people are what we call normal weight and still have these yeah. problems. A and again, I think it's hugely important to understand why the patient has developed this, mm -hmm. if we want to get somewhere with it. But eating disorders isn't just a rake skinny or a, a hugely overweight person. Yeah. Uh, eating is, I'm generalizing here, but it's often an attempt to take back control over a life that may appear chaotic or out of control. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I certainly think it's still relevant to seek help, even if you're normal weight. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Why do all SSRIs make me feel sick and what alternatives are there? Maybe you could tell people who don't know what SSRIs are. So SSRIs, they're the modern category of antidepressants. And unfortunately, there are some people that do feel sick from them. Usually, for the vast majority of people, it's only short-lived. Yeah. The other big side effect is that it annoys the sexuality. So there's no sexual drive. I've done many, many, many videos on that one, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. Re it really does. Uh -huh. But there are a few people that do get nauseous for long periods of time. Mm. And there are alternatives yeah. to those tablets. For example, something like trazodone uh, or mitazapine. There, there's some other categories of antidepressants. It can also be taken at night. Um, and that usually reduces it for, uh, somewhat. Because I guess another alternative to medication is talking therapy. Yes, please. Etc. Yeah, exercise, eating well. I know obviously that's not really, uh, you know, but it, it may well help. Well said. <laughs> really well said. Yeah. Um, okay, next category, and this is the final category, is self-harm. The first question is, do psychiatrists consider self-harm to be serious? Well, I certainly do, and I know that from my research in suicide, that if you have started to harm yourself, you put yourself at a much higher risk of completed suicide too. Mm -hmm. And it's probably something about having crossed a certain threshold, then you could maybe go further. So I do think it's a very serious sign if a young person is harming him or herself. But what's behind that? So it would be foolish to ignore that. Someone has asked, does everyone who self-harms need to see someone to get help? I don't think everyone does that. Uh, I, I think a lot, I know actually if you, people that don't get help, the vast majority stop that behavior mm -hmm. over a period of time. Mm -hmm. But I think it's certainly time it would be great to talk to parents and friends about it. Yeah. Uh, but if it continues over a longer period, and here I'm talking about weeks to months, I definitely think that some help is uh, would be indicated. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Maybe short term. Yeah. yeah. There, there are, by the way, some very good websites on the internet mm -hmm. uh, that that I can recommend. Like for example, uh, get self help. Dot com get self-help in one word it's an excellent resource completely free yeah i'll pop it in the description for you so you can go and look at that the next question is if you see someone's cuts would you ask about it or question it i absolutely would mm. i absolutely would do that um I, I i think that's my job it's interesting because i had a colleague some years ago that had scars uh, on, on her arm and I didn't really know how to respond. Yeah. But uh, this lady, uh, the lady in her 50s, she, uh, she openly explained it after a few meetings mm -hmm. why she had it. Mm -hmm. So that was courageous. But with a patient, I would definitely ask. Yeah. 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 Um, and then the final question is, what's your reaction when you find out one of your pa patients has been self-harming? Um, I, I do feel um, I do feel saddened that they are cutting in their lovely bodies. Uh, that that hurts me somewhat, uh, and I also express that. Uh, and then again, the idea is to find out why it's happened. Yeah. Why why it's a attractive for that person at that stage in their lives mm -hmm. uh, to cut, uh, and, and try to put it in to a bigger picture, so you understand. Yeah what's led to this and also certainly what can lead away from it yeah. because it is empowering when people have stopped doing this people often feel stronger yes i'm more in control now yeah definitely yeah. definitely 
and a lot of work with you know recovering from self-harm is looking at your triggers looking at you know why you do it and working out different distraction techniques or whatever it is to you know stop doing it and then we become wiser and yeah. that's of course what yeah. life is about in general mm -hmm. isn't it yeah definitely so that is the end of the questions um, thank you so much I for being on this video with, with me. Lola. It's been so great. Yeah, Lola's just chilling. <laughs> she likes therapy as well, she you know. Does. She... <laughs> Um, so anyway, if you did enjoy this video, then please do give it a thumbs up. Also, Lars during lockdown started his own YouTube channel. Yes, I've Does it learned have a name? Does it have? The virtual well-being virtual well-being so i'll link that in the description for you as well so you can go and watch his videos leave us a comment below let us know what you thought um i hope you enjoyed this and we will see you again soon because there is going to be another video specifically on bpd if you want to watch that stay tuned goodbye